Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, that's a provocative title, and as I thought about this talk today, you know, the last several months I've been thinking a lot about Edward Snowden, and it's really impacted the way I think about digital. And whether you think Edward Snowden is a traitor or a national hero doesn't much matter, but it's a provocative topic, and I think it, it's particularly relevant to digital health because really what we're looking for and what you've heard today from Andy and, and others is that we want indiscriminate, continuous, multi-source data streams to really realize the global health impact and great potential of digital health. And that's a little bit antithetical to the way, to, to way a lot of people are viewing privacy and data collection today. So I just want to share some thoughts with you about that. And as you've heard, you know, we live in a very connected society. We've got these two billion people, you know, connected. And as a physician, you know, practicing for a number of years, I can tell you, if you told me that I could help patients care for themselves, my patients and others globally care for themselves, and change their habits and their sense of um, health and illness, and I had a platform to do that that people already check 150 times a day, that sounds like a really good on-ramp, a really big advantage. That's incredibly attractive uh, if you work in healthcare. And even more profoundly than that, as I think about this topic of privacy, um, vast swaths of our culture, you know, whatever ethnicity or age or gender, are really, um, have really changed in the way they think about data. This is an image from, I guess it's uh, St. Peter's Square in Vatican City, people showing up to see uh, Pope Benedict in 2005 and now Pope Francis. And you can see that just in that brief amount of time, the number of people that want to tell this story, even a spiritual story, which would seemingly be pretty private, right? Want to tell this spiritual story through, through video, through sharing. Um, it, so what is privacy nowadays? What do, we, what do we mean by that when people clearly don't think about it in the same way? And the other thing that people like to get completely righteous about that, that I've been thinking about lately is, you know, this idea that everybody's stealing our data. You know, damn it, you know, I go on Google and I don't, I don't trust those guys and they use and they mine my data and how about, the, how about the even lower life form behind them, the data brokers that don't even give me a transaction for my data? And what, when I think about it, you, you provide your digital footprint to something, um, to some tech company, you know, what are you getting? Well, you're getting unbelievable <laughs> buying power and diversity and, you know, the ability to do things efficiently. You're getting entertainment, whether it's sports or something else. You're getting information about things you deeply care about, like your children that really help you in many ways. And you're getting education, something like um, 30 million students uh, globally are hooked up with their teachers through, through some guy, type of Google facilitated educational experience. You maybe even you're finding your mate, your life partner. And what amazing potential, what would that transaction look like if you could apply it to health? Some of the things that Andy talked about, real game changers, and what does that mean for privacy? What are we giving up? What are we getting back? What's the value in that? Seems pretty pretty high. And then the reason I'm interested in digital health is, is the following story. You know, I went to college for four years, and I went to medical school, and I did a seven-year residency. So pretty hard work, you know, until I was in my 30s, and then 20 years of practicing. So who have I impacted? Well, I'm an interventional cardiologist who does those procedures listed on top. I've done some clinical trial work, so ability to impact larger amounts of people, looking at new evidence for new device therapies generally. And then I've seen, you know, a ton of patients. So in all that time and all that effort, I've seen 37 or impacted 37,000 patients, and it feels, kind of feels like more. And in 2006, when the implanted devices that, that I implant and research in uh, became wireless, meaning they can transmit data every day from patients' home, this amazing computer in their heart transmitting data about their cardiac function, I, we started a national research trial, myself and some colleagues, and within just eight years, we've been able to make observations in 308,000 patients, so a tenfold increase in the number of people uh, that I can impact. And this was done at a much lower pain point uh, and much easier, like digital does, takes away, you know, adds efficiency, takes away a lot of cost compared to the traditional work I do, continue to do. So how do you integrate those? And that's been an enormous motivator. We found that when you follow people with these very expensive uh, devices that cost about you know twenty to forty thousand dollars upfront cost, you can really increase the value proposition because if you follow them remotely and involve people in their care and enfranchise them in the conversation, uh, they get invested and they actually live longer because they're active participants. And if you 
integrate things and platforms that are already enormously popular, whether it's fitness tracking or social networks or gaming, in this case, something our cinema school developed with us, a, a developing a game of blood farm for diabetic children to share, uh, to enhance adherence to blood testing, and they build these kind of morbid blood farms and share them, share blood with their friends, but it, 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 it enhances um, compliance, you know, which is huge for those children. And then taking biometrics and integrating, into the, in, integrating them into very successful platforms like photo sharing, in this case, heart rate. So yet another way, uh, if you're a photo sharing person, which is kind of a weird aesthetic in itself, but a kind of an abstract and concrete way to, to learn other people and, and collect your medical record, if you will. So clearly revolutionary medicine is here. The whole definition and the whole uh, sense of the machine-human interaction is changing as we transmit data from our body computer, cognitive, or, or from our vital organs to, to computing platforms, and then, then look at that data. So what we hear a lot, and what I particularly hear that's, that's a little soul-killing from traditional medical environments, wherever they are, is that you know, this privacy thing is so big and so dangerous when applied to such an intimate thing as healthcare that we need to like slow down and we haven't even started. We need to slow down and not do this digital stuff. It's very culturally disruptive. And I think about antibiotics, which everybody would agree have been an enormous advance in civilization. What if when people were developing antibiotics, somebody said, no, don't do it because it's gonna mean eventually antibiotic resistance. And antibiotic resistance is gonna be killer bugs in, in our hospitals and killing the most vulnerable patients. And even our athletes' knees will get, and, and you know, all that is true. All that is, has really happened. And all that needs to be managed. But that is absolutely not the reason, would not have been an acceptable reason not to develop antibiotics. I think these things are going to happen. I think they're going to be worse things that we can imagine that happen, but the overall benefit has just, has just seemed to me has to be better. So for the area now, and I think what you're hearing is it's right now all about getting these signals out of your body computer, whether from your head or, or other places. And according to a recent Pew survey, Americans are already tracking their health. And Unfortunately, about half of those people track their health or the health of their loved ones in their head. And then the, the majority of the remainder track it on, on paper. And only about 17% of people actually track it digitally. But there's, you know, and we've talked about these, any number of products that can help you send signals from your body computer to, to other things. Some have real biometrics, things that to a medical community really have value, a real EKG, a real respiratory rate, a real calorie counter. Accurate things that can actually constitute your medical record in a, in a meaningful way and help us predict things, and, and some, some don't. But they're popular. There are many on the market. It's a the market is growing, and they're worn all over the place, and they're worn mostly for fitness or lifestyle and kind of coming into these other areas. I think we've heard a lot, and it's very important to think about the integration of biometrics and health data into everything, not just because of the analytics, but because we, know we really want to create this generation of people who are comfortable, fearless patients who know not as much as maybe the doctor does, but, but are completely empowered by their their numbers and their data and educated. We're trying to create a healthcare literacy among very young people, you know, from the beginning of their lives that allows them to effectively partner with us. So if you look at the sort of screen that we were looking at in 1955, the television screen and the top companies, Fortune 500 companies then, and the, the companies now on the dominant screen that we're looking at, which is mobile all over the world, you know, look at the information tech what we used to refer to as cyber companies, they're in a pretty good position financially. They're certainly in a fantastic position to deliver uh, health care globally. Whether or not they have the appetite or the culture for it is unclear. Traditional medical establishments clearly haven't really developed the appetite and culture for it yet. You know, an enormous boon to the United States has been the electronic medical record. That's one thing, what, however you feel about the Affordable Care Act, the Affordable Care Act did, and, and the financial stimulus package in the US did subsidize an enormous amount of activity around the EMR. So suddenly in the United States, all big hospital data is liquid. It's no longer confined. It is available for all the things that, all the kind of manipulation you've heard about. One of the things my husband likes to decry is the loss of really credible journalism and what's happened in media. And I kind of view this differently. I look at the fact that, okay, everybody got one or at least one newspaper back when, and now a third of households get a newspaper. If you told me as a doctor, you can, your bricks and mortar facility or your hospital, you can take two thirds of the patients away 
and only use your doctors and your expensive facilities to care for those who actually needed you, the, the sick people and everything else you could do virtually and patients would feel just as cared for at this virtual umbrella and they wouldn't have to drive in or leave their children as you heard or the other children home take a sick child in. I'd say that's an amazing thing, give me that. And in the same way that Andy talked about, um, the idea that healthcare can be on demand and it can be on demand, and not only will it be on demand, can I you know, listen to the music that I'm, I'm always kind of stuck in 1976 to 84 in my musical taste, but not only can I do that and pull any of that up at any time and go down the memory road, that, that this, these analytics will also tell me that I like Little Wayne, and that'll be a discovery process for me, and that will really addict me you know, to Spotify or something else. And so that's the part of digital music that I think is most fascinating, and even more than that, um, if, what if I could integrate my biometrics with that? You know, what if I could start to learn how that music really impacts me and my performance or my resilience or whatever these concepts are that we're trying to hook together digitally around health to be able to provide that continuous insight that will addict and habituate people to these digital products that everybody's uh, making now. And to take it even further, I mean, you know, what Amazon does for me, and I pay attention to this stuff cognitively, what do I like? You know, what am I gonna like to read next? That's great. You know, I discovered a book in my hotel room last night written by a, uh, on, the, on the German Air Force during World War II that was pretty fascinating. But then I went on to Amazon. I started looking at books of the history of the German Air Force, and it was even better than me just happening on that book in my hotel room. So that's the kind of thing I think that's really exciting as we apply it to health. And, you know, there'll be discovery. There'll be discovery in healthcare that will be from the proletariat, that, that will be just from people making these observations based on good data that will enhance and amplify what we're doing as clinicians. And there's just enormous promise in that. So we d privacy is kind of, you know, what is privacy now? It's sort of out the door because we do need all this data from different feeds and we need it all the time and we need it on the ground. So we used to live in a mining society, and you know, it, it, now we live in a data mining society, and look how much happier those people are on the left <laughs> than, the, than the people on the right. And the money's there. I think everybody agrees with that, however you define it, and people are investing in this you know, based on theoretical investors thinking there's just money and big data, and they don't really go any further than that. So they're, but I think it's pretty clear just based on the list of successful companies, I told you that there's a lot of information in it. And just look at the Facebook acquisition of WhatsApp. So what did they get, right? They got, uh, an, uh, they have a billion people, they have they got 495 million more people who you know have carrier independent text messaging, they paid a lot of money for it. In aggregate, it's probably enormously valuable or they wouldn't have done it, but individually even, you know, back of the envelope, it's $42 per WhatsApp user. I mean, if that was applied to healthcare, that could potentially pay for healthcare for family in, in, in some economies and other things. So this is all yet to be monetized, but I do think there is promise in it because this is a frequently asked question, anybody starting a company in this room, how does digital health, what's the revenue stream? So, you know, still not completely clear, right? So there will be a new e-health economy. I think it will largely be based around uh, big data. It will largely challenge our notion of privacy as we think about it. And a McKinsey report recently found just with EMR, just with electronic medical record unity and uh, dissemination across major US medical centers, the savings are immediately going to be $450 billion. And that's really just having the data there and that's really just getting physicians to sort of follow treatment guidelines. That's all that is. And there's so much more, as you've heard today. And the nightmare stories about privacy, some are real and scary, scary as all get out, like the idea that you know, victims of violent crime would, you would have their data somehow sold to some you know, backdoor marketer. But other things are, are a little bit hype, like this idea that, that healthcare.gov is going to share information with Facebook. That's, that's great news. If I'm on Facebook and I say, yes, yeah, share my information with healthcare.gov, then healthcare.gov will have my medical information and my social, that'll probably come up with something that will guide me into a healthier way of living or help me care for somebody I care about in my social network better or make me an ambassador for healthcare in some way. So I don't view all of this as, as uh, negative. I think some of it is incredibly positive. And already we're seeing um, companies make use of this. Sick Weather, Health Map, these are companies that take all sorts of feeds 
whether it's a Twitter feed that predicts postpartum depression based on pregnant women's Twitter feeds or it's some other thing. My child has chicken pox on Facebook. I didn't go to work today because I have a fever. And being able to try to create these predictive analytics around who's going to get sick and why and what is the inner relationship, as we heard earlier, between that and where they are in their environment and any dangers inherent there. More importantly, the big progress has been made in crime and predicting criminal events just based on looking at known criminals' self, you know, uh, frequency of calls and, and where those calls are happening. We're able to predict major uh, crime events. And the thing that is very encouraging, I think, is this idea of crisis mapping, which is happening in a lot of different places in the world, but the ability to identify very early or before they happen um, uh, uh, situations where terror or violence is inflicted on individuals or women and children and being able to steer those vulnerable populations away from those areas. Very important and really real um, activity that's going on in, in Africa, Haiti, and even, even in the States. So what we're trying to do, I think all of us in this room, is make it better, make it easier, make it more friendly, make it safer, and digital certainly seems that um, it will be able to do that. From, from my own standpoint, you know, I'm a, I'm a cardiologist, 17 million people die of heart disease, one in six Americans dies of heart disease, somebody dies every minute and a half, about seven million heart procedures done a year in the States that cost $500 billion to deliver that care, all of, or 300 billion, 300 billion maybe, all of cancers, 200 billion, big problem. You know, we announced this initiative a couple of years ago just to digitally once collect the heartbeat of everybody in the world from an experiential standpoint to familiarize people with the fact that by recording and contributing their biometrics and how they feel about it and integrating that with the rest of humanity, we can start to build these data banks that will allow us to predict and protect uh, people across the globe and leverage the expertise of people like me all over the place, not just you know, in East Los Angeles. So I imagine this you know, completely connected life where that baby has a bigger medical record uh, amassed by, by the time she's you know, in kindergarten than any of my high-end you know, heart failure or cardiac patients, and that, that, that's just there uh, should she need it and help, helping her uh, live a, a fuller life and that we're all walking around as we do now and as many of you are doing in this room, integrating our health data with, with the uh, internet uh, of everything. Thank you. So let's use this stage to make a call out to the bosses of Facebook and Google and Apple and Amazon. Yeah, you know, so I do write them letters when I'm... Use the like, stage. Hey, yeah, yeah. We've we got lots and of great I, you know, I, here. I say, Mark, you know, you have, a, you have a billion people and I'm really happy you married a pediatrician and I'm glad you, you uh, had people sign up for organ donation on Facebook because <laughs> organ donation with heart transplant in the States, there are only two to 3,000 done and it's been stuck. People won't sign their driver's licenses to donate their organs. And so, you know, you've got all these 20,000 people at any one time dying in a hospital, can't get a heart, right? So Facebook puts organ donation on last May and on real state registries, which is how you register for an organ donation in the state, um, there was, I think, a hundredfold increase in the amount of people that, that agreed to, you know, register and donate their organs. So to me, that's, you know, can be transformative. So those are kind of letters I write in my head and sometimes I actually write. So let's come up with a headline now. Leslie Saxon asks, Finish the sentence. Um, ask, face, ask Facebook and Amazon to take their enormous uh, social network and analytical power to transform global health. And save lives. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.